Are we ready? Just a second. Oh, okay. Let me know when you want me to start. All right. And then Recording since I got the okay. yeah. Since I've got the um, slides, just let me know when you guys want me to move to the next slide. Perfect. Thanks, Byron. Got it. <clears throat> All right, it's right on noon. Let's go. Ahead. We got a more than a dozen people on already, and uh, they're going to keep joining in. Uh, people tend to float in <clears throat> in a few minutes. Um, and if somebody could help out, if you see these uh, people joining as we go, uh, this is being recorded, and we we keep these up on the uh, the recordings or slides or something on the uh, Calms uh, web page for webinars. And we got one more coming up in next month, but we don't have a date yet set for it. Uh, but anyway, so I'm Stephen McCord. I'm hosting this one. I'm uh, the, one of the Northern California directors of Calms, California Lake Management Society. And um, let's go ahead and do the sponsor, uh, a moment with a sponsor who happens to be uh, our Calms president right now and uh, one or two colleagues. So you guys take it away and then I'll introduce Laura as our speaker. All right. Thank you, Stephen. So my name is Andrea Seelock, and I'm the Western Region Team Leader with CPRO's Aquatic Division. So thank you all for the opportunity today to sponsor this webinar. Um, I am joined uh, with uh, by your fearless leader, Byron Fer Furman, and my colleague, who is an aquatic technical development uh, scientist for CPRO. And also, uh, Ms. Aspen Kenyon is joining us. Um, she is our Pacific Southwest Technical Specialist. You can go forward, Byron. So I'm going to provide just a quick uh, history and update on CPRO, and then I'm going to pass it over to Aspen and Byron to provide an update on some of our newer uh, technologies. So CPRO was founded in the mid-90s with just one aquatic herbicide, Sonar AS, and since that time, they have expanded their portfolio to include brands like Captain XTR Algicide, uh, Comine and Nautique aquatic herbicides, and also uh, expanded their line of Sonar formulations to include another liquid, Sonar Genesis, and a few pellet formulations such as Sonar One. Uh, more recently, our uh, aquatics portfolio expanded quite a bit through the acquisition of Applied Bio chemists in October of 2020. So we now own and manufacture uh, brands such as Aquashade, Qtrain Plus, Clearigate, just to name a few. Go ahead, Byron. Um, and so CPRO is a company that's very focused on innovation and bringing new solutions and technologies to market. Um, so a few years ago, we had the opportunity to introduce a new herbicide with a brand new active called Priscilacor. Uh, so this is a systemic, fast-acting, long-lasting herbicide. Um, it controls uh, aquatic species like milfoil, hydrilla, uh, while it is also selective. Um, and it's very unique in that it is one of very few aquatic herbicides that has a reduced risk classification from the US EPA. Uh, the great thing about it is that you can experience multiple years of control from just one application, uh, and it is currently pending registration in California, so stay tuned. Uh, this has been a, a long process, and we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, so we hope this calendar year. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Aspen. Thanks, Andrea. The CPRO team is really excited about the introduction of Comine Descend as a new tool in our aquatic herbicide toolbox. Descend was created with an innovative new microcrystal technology. This means that while the herbicide handles like a liquid formulation, when it comes in contact with water, Descend will microcrystallize and sink to target specific treatment zones. Comine Descend is a 22.9% chelated copper formulation. It's a broad spectrum herbicide with no irrigation restrictions. It's easy to apply and fast acting. And in the next slide, you'll see a video demonstrating how this technology works. All right, and Descend is federally approved and we expect California registration soon. And for more information, please feel free to reach out to our team. With that, I'll pass it on to Byron. Thanks, Aspen and Andrea. Let's see. Um, so yeah, I see a lot of familiar faces or um, at least names on the screen. Um, nice to see everybody. So I work on mostly the nutrient binding um, products for CPRO. So I make a lot of the Utrasorbs. 
Um, we're pretty excited about those. They seem to be working really well, get a lot of positive feedback. Um, and I'll just say I'm looking forward to seeing everyone um, at the conference in October. Uh, I don't think we've officially announced it yet, but it's going to be October 11th to 13th in Lake Arrowhead. And it's going to be at the Lake Arrowhead Resort and Spa. Um, you'll get to meet Andrea and Aspen. Um, they're awesome people. It's really fun working with them and, you know, just getting out on the boat and hearing all of their knowledge. But, yeah, at the end of the day, CPRO just tries to do all things lake management. Um, we've had a good presence in California, so we work with, like, Cal Boating. And, you know, that goes from anywhere from algae control, you know, and, and shorter term um management strategies to you know aquatic weeds uh, we focus on systemics obviously so we try to have longer control better control of the invasives without harming the natives and you know more recently we've been really invested in the nutrient binding um, and just trying to get to the root of the problem of both the algae and the aquatic plants um, so yeah um, i'm looking forward to seeing everybody at the conference and um, thanks for having us Thanks, Byron, <clears throat> and thanks, Cpro, for sponsoring this one. Um, you can stop sharing, and Lars, you can start sharing if you'd like. Um, let's see if that transition goes well. Great. Okay, so um, today's talk by Lars Anderson. Uh, Lars is. Uh, uh, lives in, in the Davis area and uh, often works up at Lake Tahoe. And um, he presented at the Columns Conference up there and was it 2019, I think? It was pre-COVID at any rate, because um, it was in person, I remember it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this uh, he's going to be talking about a really interesting project uh, that's ongoing. Um, it's uh, quite the intensive study of aquatic weed, man weed management, as you'll as you'll learn. So uh, thanks, Lars, for offering to do this and take it from here. And, uh, sorry, a couple other housekeeping things. Um, most everybody looks like you're doing a good job of not having your video on. Same with audio. Uh, there is a chat feature, so you're welcome to put uh, questions and such for Lars in there. And and at the end, with uh, or, uh, whatever time is remaining, we can go through some of those. So take it away, Lars. Oh, you're on mute. How did that happen? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, there you go. Let's see if I can get ahead with the. Yeah, now it's not going here. Hang on one second. There we go. Yeah, so right. I'd like to, to give you a little background about the project at Tahoe. We call it the CMT, which is the Control Methods Test. Um, and I'll talk about the implementation and how it's been coordinated up there this last year, and then some monitoring results, including water quality and, and most important thing is the project uh, efficacy what's working up there so far and then a little bit into the second year it's a three-year project so we'll be doing our second year starting right now as a matter of fact with non-herbicide methods just to give you the, the beginning we were uh, given a permit to apply herbicides in one year only uh, last year in the specific sites it's really a test and then the subsequent two years are for a non-herbicide project uh, applications so to familiarize you, if you haven't been to South Lake Tahoe, there's a very large marina. Um, this is the uh, Tahoe Keys Marina, and it's got two entrances to the main Lake Tahoe, the West Channel and the East Channel, you can see there. Uh, the CMT project is in the West Lagoon and Lake Talac. You can see those in the upper part of that. There's uh, 1,500 homes here, a lot of folks, um, a lot of docks, and a lot of uh, perfect uh, uh, you know, conditions for aquatic weeds to proliferate in this area because the water temperatures get here probably five or six or eight degrees warmer than the lake itself. So perfect conditions. And there's a lot of runoff into it too. So there's a nutrient issue as well uh, in the system. So uh, it is an interesting environment there. Um, Bay Tahoe is considered a tier three water, an outstanding natural resource water. So EPA uh, applies a lot more stringent re uh, requirements for water quality for anything that's introduced into the lake and so on, much more stringent than other lakes uh, in the country. Um, and up until 2015, there was a prohibition against using any herbicides of any kind, any pesticides in the lake. But an exemption was approved in 2015 by the Lahontan Water Board, and that simply allowed you to apply for an exemption. There's still a prohibition, but you could apply for an exemption, uh, which we did in 2017, and, and through a long process, we were able to get a permit. 
Um, the other regulatory agency up there besides the Water Board is Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, the TRPA. And they are, so these two agencies work together. TRPA is a bi-state uh, regulatory agency, so it can, it's concerned with both Nevada and California because the lake is split, uh, as you, most of you know. So, it's, uh, so we have two regulatory organizations that control what goes on in the lake. And a lot of public interest, what happens, there's a lot of uh, stakeholders who are concerned about it. There are people who live in the lake, people who take their water directly from the lake for potable and drinking purposes and so on. And a lot of recreational um, venues up there that are uh, for which the lake is, is obviously essential. So we've got this a lot of opinions on this. And, and part of the reason this project took so long, and by the way, I, I first did some work up there in 95 and tried to get a, a small project going in 95. And here it was 2022, finally, when we got permit. You can see it's been a long haul. So you all kind of know this pattern, but I want to point out that Lake Tahoe right now has had these aquatic plants for quite some time. However, currently pondweed was, we discovered that in 23, uh, 2003 rather, and um, now they're finally realizing it's spreading rapidly in the Keys, but also in Lake Tahoe proper along the South Shore. So we're hoping to do something to stop that spread, at least for curly leaf pondweed. There are other, other projects going on outside the Keys as well. So the key events that led to this were was the two-day uh, workshop in 2007 that I helped pull together. Um, Water Board finally got this uh, WDR requirement and the exemption that I mentioned. So we may use herbicides if they approve it. We got an exemption that was not supported. Uh, we applied for it in 2017. Finally, we got one that was approved by the Water Board and TRPA in 2022. The thing to remember about this is that January approval gave us about maybe two months to get this whole thing pulled together for last spring's application. Uh, pretty tight, a tight window. And just to remind you, we're looking at milfoil and curly leaf pondweed that are proliferating in the keys and in the lake itself. And you all know that curly leaf pondweed spreads by these trions, which are produced by the thousands on those plants by midsummer. And that's a close up to show you what we're looking at there. In the lower right hand side, some of you may have not seen a sprouting turion, but that's what they look like. And those typically sprout late summer to early fall. And so they get a head start in the next spring on the on the native plants. Here's the here's the pattern of increase in curly leaf pondweed just to show you the, the problem. In 2014, you see we had about 20% or so of the Rake samples uh, where it occurred, and now we're up to over 50%, probably more than 60 to 70% now in 2022. So you can see it's really been a huge increase in, in curly leaf pondweed. And the trouble is that up until now, uh, the only method for control has been harvesting. And you know, when you harvest these plants, all the fragments break loose, particularly these turions get carried around with the, the shoots and on, and on their own. So that's part of why it's spread into the lake, uh, at least in the early 2020s or so. One of the innovations we're looking at is UV light. This is an example of an array of an LED UV light system. This happens to be at um, Lakeside uh, Marina, uh, sort of on the near the Nevada side. But that uh, array on the lower left are the lights that are showing down in the plants. And John Peluccio with a, a company, an innovative company, has produced this system, developed it over the last seven or eight years. And this Caho Keys project is the first real operational view of it or, or experimental use of it. It has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. One disadvantage is that you can see you have to do these sections that you expose and then move it on to the next one. And so the larger the array, the more efficient you are with it. And they're still playing around with the uh, length of exposure. It looks like it's five to 10 minutes once it sits there, but it is effective and it does kill these plants pretty dramatically um, when they're exposed properly. The other disadvantage is you can get some self shading when you have dense populations. So the entire uh, strategies to come in early, as it is with most of our, our methods to control these aquatic plants. So the first year goals were to reduce the target aquatic plant by 75%, that is the bio volume, and that was based on our uh, uh, the um, scans using our acoustic scan systems, as well as rake samples, maintain a, a vessel hull clearance for, um, for navigation, improve the conditions for the native plants. And we do have native plants there. Our primary native we're trying to hold on to is Elodea canadensis. Um, it's a very low growing plant there and very it's it's there, but in sparse populations. It's being out competed by these invasive plants. And we've got the permit compliance to worry about. I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. And of course, maintain the herbicides within the boundaries of the, the, the uh, lagoon. Now, one of the concerns and our permits required us to keep those herbicides from ever entering Lake Tahoe proper. 
And if you remember on the first slide I showed you, there are two routes that can do that, two channels. We're only worried about the west side, but for this reason, we put up curtains as barriers to prevent movement of the aquatic herbicide. And of course, we had a final uh, report that was due on March 15th. We did that in 160 pages, 35 appendices. I'll tell you, that was a lot of work, and there's a lot of data in there that you can actually obtain uh, either on the, the Hall Keys website or through the Lahotan Water Board. And then, of course, for year two, we're using that data to decide where we can apply these group two, group B methods that are non herbicide methods, uh, bottom barriers, uh, uh, diver pulling, and then also more UV light. So here's the strategy we had one year knockdown with herbicides on the far left hand side uh, and do it selectively. And we did use indithol and triclopyr as selective herbicides to maintain those that Eladia population out there. Um, year two, we're into now uh, only using those group B methods that are uh, non herbicide. We're now deciding where we can use those and how many we can use. And all during the entire three year program, we're going to have environmental monitoring going on, very intensive monitoring in the first year as you would expect, but the first time herbicides were ever used in Lake Tahoe. So we basically had hyper monitoring program going on with practically daily sampling of herbicides, um, sampling of water quality parameters and so on. So you're pretty familiar with this approach. The way to control if you're using a herbicide is get the right uh, target, uh, the right contact for information on it, concentration, contact time and the, and the correct herbicide. So those are our three target species that we were shooting for. And so we used uh, indithol and triclopyr. And, and note that we really used low rates. We had done some dye studies up there to show we had retention of several weeks in these areas, these uh, in the Tahoe Keys. So we knew we could drop our rates down way below the, the maximum. And so indithol was at two parts per million and triclopyr at one part per million. And all of our treatments were done in trips kit. We had small one to one and a half or two acre plots there. Uh, to get some data that could be replicated. So that was uh, another complexity to this system. It wasn't just treating a few acres and then walk away. We had several sites up there. This gives you an idea of the project implementation management. I'm not going to get into it too much. The green boxes are the regulatory agencies. All the blue are the management programs to it. That uh, sort of pinkish box at the bottom uh, where the part <clears throat> can folks hear me? Can somebody go off mute? Maybe Byron. Yeah, I'm I'm not seeing a screen and I think Lars cut out oh, maybe a couple minutes darn. ago. Yeah. He's at UCD too. I, I thought it was me. Did he did he uh go silent for about 30 seconds earlier? Yeah. Yeah, so 30 seconds right. or so before his video stopped and um yep. didn't hear anything. All right. I would, Let's uh Let's give them a second to log back in. Hopefully he's figured that out. He's yeah, he's he's off or he's not logged in anymore. Sorry, everybody. Just uh, hold on. Hold tight. And uh, the the sad irony is Lars was working at his home office or something and the Internet wor wasn't working right. So he went to the UC Davis campus where he has an office and <laughs> and it doesn't work there. <clears throat> he was cursed.
He may be uh, just running a monologue as we're sitting here waiting for him. See if I can reach him. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, I'll give a, a pitch for the conference. So, yeah, we're going to have yeah. it at Lake Arrowhead Resort and Spa. It's a beautiful place. Uh, David James, he's a professor at UNLV. He's been working really hard to get us set up with a field trip. Um, we're going to be out on the Queen Mary, um, kind of zooming around Lake Arrowhead, which is a really, really gorgeous lake if you guys haven't been there. Um, but yeah, throw that on your calendar. So it's going to be October 11th to 13th. We're also going to have some um, working groups. So stay tuned. We'll have some email announcements and a newsletter, but uh, we're uh, perspectively looking at having like a Habs working group, uh, Lake Chemistry. Oh, there's Lars. Yep. <clears throat> we back? But, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you, you, we lost you at some point, Lars. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm going to, can you see my screen? Yeah, uh, we see you. So you'll need to okay, reshare. Okay, right. Yeah, okay. I had to and go back onto my hotspot. I can't believe what happened here. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I was telling people it's ironic. This is your second shot too. Yeah. You tried uh, at your home or whatever. Okay. So thanks yeah. everybody for your patience. Hang on. And uh, for everybody, we'll we'll uh, we'll begin uh, give a quick updates on the Calms conference later on. Yeah, uh, is that coming up now? No, it shows, uh, I don't know, some internet accounts thing. Okay, hold on. Share a different window or something. Yeah, hang on. Good, because I see you up there. Let's try that. Yep, that got there it? you go. Yep. All right, sorry. Yeah, so I'll skip through pretty quick. You guys know most of this, but the, the point was we're using these selective herbicides, and uh, that's the team. This is the kind of critical thing I wanted to get into. Um, once we had our permit in January, uh, last January, we had a very short uh, sort of window to get everything pulled together. And what this shows is the um, sequence of events. We had to have things right. We had to have enough you know, plant growth. The temperatures had to be up in the lake. And the thing, as you may recall, very different from this year, we had very low snowpack last year. So we had a very short time in which we have water flowing into the Keys. And that was a key criterion for doing the project. And in order to, to get our approval to go, we actually had to demonstrate that we had flow going into the Keys and um, and we did this by measuring the, with a flow meter going in there. So everything came together and we got started on May 25th. We were lucky to do that one, but that, that worked out OK. So let's go up here. So on May 25th, everything started up. Uh, we had our curtains in place. I mentioned those. We had a team that was ready to respond to any spills we had, which we didn't have any, fortunately. And we had a couple of temporary ramps we had to make to get behind these curtains. You can see the mouth to lack in the upper right. and uh, curtain going across there. These are basically turbidity curtains uh, that we used. The, the curtains uh, isolated three areas in the south and in the western part of the lagoon, area A, B, and C. C is really late to lac down at the bottom. But area A is important to remember because that's where we had most of our endothal sites and some triclop here in there. But that means uh, all these areas that are A, B, and C, there was no boating allowed from the last third, third week in May till basically September, a long time out there. Uh, while the project was underway. And all that sampling had to go on behind the curtains. So there are a lot of uh, boats out there, a lot of crews doing the sampling for water quality and for herbicide uh, measurements too. So here's our treatment uh, scheme. We had um, with the site numbers on the left, it's not so important, except that site one, two, and three were all herbicide uh, endothal treatments. Um, eight, nine, and 15 were our herbicide only uh, with triclopyr. 15 was an endothal site. We also used some combination sites and I'll Describe those in just a minute. In those sites, only the shoreline was treated with the herbicide, either triclopyr or endothal. 
And the center part of those sites was supposed to be uh, exposed to the UV treatment. So we have a combination of the deeper water where the UV was used and shallow water with less herbicide on the, on the edges of it. And part of the reason is because the, the UV system has a hard time negotiating around docks and pilings. It can do it, but it takes a lot of time. So in order to be efficient, we figured let's just have a UV light go down the middle of these sites and the herbicides will be done on the side and we'll get a combination treatment that way. So this is how they were all done. We finished up on the 31st of May with our last treatment in Lake Tawak at uh, two parts per million endothal. Just to show you how those combination sites worked, we had a treatment of light down the middle, and some was from the edge of the dock to the shoreline with the herbicides. In this case, uh, for Twiclopyr, we used the pelleted uh, herbicide formulation, uh, and endothal was liquid formulation. I'll show you some shots of that in a minute. So this is a typical application. You've probably mostly seen these before. We use rhodamine dye to show where the, the herbicides were applied. Uh, on the left is a triclopyr uh, uh, pelleted application. Once the pellets hey, were Lars, in the water, they went by. Yes. Lars, yeah. you, sorry, you you, uh, you cut out for about 30 seconds. It just stopped. Oh. So um, Let me back the, up. You, were, you were describing some things in that. Yeah, there. You were you're that slide okay. and uh, mentioned the uh, the combo combination or, or the concentrations at Lake Talak were two. Yeah, OK, sorry. Yeah, so just to summarize, we had um, herbicide only sites. We had um, endothal and triclopyr. Then we had these combination sites. And then the combination sites, only the shoreline, the near shorelines were treated with herbicides. The central part of those sites were to be treated with uh, the UV exposures. OK, and that's kind of how they look. That diagram shows the application approach to those sites. And that's really how we did it. There's the rhodamine dye in there. I mentioned that before. Most of you have seen that applied before. It was very useful in our case because we also had to determine if any of the dye moved beyond our curtains. And we had some cases where dye came out. We sampled for that, but it didn't last very long. And, and uh, it's really a good, a good tool to use when you're really trying to track where that herbicide is going. Some examples of 14 days after treatment, just to show you that we triclopyr was knocking out that her, the uh, milfoil pretty quickly. Notice the the LED is green and healthy, and there's a there's a fragment of curly leaf pondweed that's still quite healthy. The right hand two panels are rake samples from the control sites. In this case, um, about six weeks after treatment, and then the lower left is another six weeks after treatment. And the only thing we're seeing now in these endothal sites was healthy LED. Uh, milfoil was pretty much uh, falling apart, as well as coontail and curly leaf pondweed. And the right-hand side is just a blow-up of show how healthy that Aladea is uh, with the treatment of endothal six weeks after treatment. So quite selective, and really that's what we were aiming for in those sites. This one is, is again, the shot of the keys, and all those little dots out there are points where we had to do uh, water quality and herbicide monitoring, and it was a lot. So basically, we had nutrients uh, had to be sampled, uh, DO, pH, all those all those typical water quality parameters you look for. And ultimately, there were about 75,000 data points collected over last summer. And just the raking alone, which was every two weeks to determine the condition of the plants, we wound up with almost 7,000 rake points taken in the system. And so you can see we just have a, a whole bunch of data um, that had to be crunched over the uh, fall and, and winter to pull all this together. But you can see where those sites are. The, all that blue area are the, the linear uh, laminar flow aeration, which is another kind of approach we used. But the sort of whitish sites are the control sites. But you can see we had uh, spread out those those replica replicated sites around the western side, the left-hand side of it. And uh, we had sampling within the sites, sampling outside the sites. Basically, we, we sampled every part of that lagoon practically that we could. And just to show you what the break samples looked like, 30 points were taken for each site. Each site was about an acre to two acres. And that's kind of how those, those uh, physical rake samples were taken. And of course, every two weeks, in addition to the rake samples, we were doing the hydroacoustic scan. So we had lots of information on the bio volume in those sites. Just to, to summarize what we found there, I'll talk about the effectiveness of the treatments, uh, monitoring a little bit, our compliance, which we did pretty well, actually, and then you know, to end up with the two-year uh, group uh, B plans for year two. So this is an interesting slide. You've some, seen some of these before. It's a heat map using the hydroacoustic scan, and I will show you right off the bat, 
that this was taken 120 days after treatment and everything green is good. That means low bile volume, yellow is moderate. Everything is red is very high bile volume of plants. And again, this is total submerged plants, not selective by the targets versus native, it's all plants. But notice on that area A over there, on the left-hand side, that's where the endothal treatment was primarily and some triclopyr treatments. Notice endothal in Lake Talak, area C, still clear, um, basically 120 days post-treatment. And the triclopyr are the ends there. There's some yellow and some green, so we had some control there. But keep in mind, at this point, we've allowed the other plants to grow, even though we've controlled milfoil very well in those sites. And then lastly, if you look at the UV only sites, you'll see there's green areas and a little bit of yellow and a couple of red patches, but actually pretty effective with the UV treatments. And those were repeated treatments in there uh, as well. So pretty good effect uh, for the treatments across there. So this is how we did the monitoring. It's kind of interesting. We did uh, the hydroacoustic scans, of course, every two weeks. Uh, we did physical rate samples. I mentioned that uh, very intense sampling. Every brick was photographed. Um, we have different ways of looking at that. We actually could tell by the rate content and by the percent by species of what that sort of uh, relative contribution was of each species for each site for each month across there. And we did we did also uh, do some assessments for for HABs, and we did have HABs issue. And again, very low water, very warm water last year, so we had HAB problems as well. So just to summarize the results in a really simple way to look at this, on the left-hand side are the treatments in the fall, triclopyr, UV, and then the bottom, I've, I've indicated the combinations with, which we really didn't get to, and I'll tell you why in a minute. We did the, we did the herbicide uh, work, but we were not able to get into the UV equipment. Now on the top, we have our metrics that we're shooting for, vessel hole clearance, uh, revised, uh, that is the uh, bio volume being reduced by 75% and encouraging native plants. So within the fall, you can see we, we got all three plants controlled very well. We actually had native plants, uh, sorry, the native Elodea was quite healthy. Some of the other native plants we had some variable response to. Triclopyr in total was not that good, and that's simply because we only controlled milfoil and the other plants still grew in those sites. So the whole clearance wasn't that great, nor was the, the bio volume reduction. So bio volume again is based on hydroacoustic scans, which does not separate the species. It's looking at the total uh, submerged growth under the boat. But notice on that bio volume, we actually did get 90% control plus of your raisin water milfoil, which we would expect with triclopyr. It was very effective. And in this case too, with triclopyr, we had good control of the other of milfoil, but uh, no effect on Elodea canadensis, our native plant. In the UV sites, we had good control for the UV clearance, uh, vessel hull clearance. That's the arrow going up. Um, for bio volume, we had pretty good control. We had 60 to 70% in most areas. So that really was the meeting of criterion to move on to, to group new methods with the UV as well. The only problem we had with the um, UV system was we actually reduced our native population. So it clearly showed that the UV system is not selective. So even though it's effective and is non-chemical, we're getting some effects, some impacts on the desirable uh, native plants in that system. Just to show you some results, a little bit busy, but it's pretty clear to see everything on the bottom, all those pies are on the, uh, there are the control sites on the bottom, start with those. And you have pretreatments on the left and going for 28 days, 56 and so on. You can see it didn't change a whole lot, but you would expect the controls didn't, wouldn't change too much. But if you look at the endothal treatment, we can see what happened right away to milfoil. We got it down to pretty much nothing by 84 days. Um, same with the other plants. Um, natives uh, were doing pretty well except for the last treatment, but you can see the dr dramatic difference we had with those treatments up there. And that's based on basically the, the uh, occurrence of the plants in those sites. This is triclopyr. Again, the bottom are all the controls, same as you just saw, because we used the same three sets of controls for all these. But you can see what happened there. We basically took care of the milfoil, as you expect, pretty well. Didn't have much impact on the coon tail, as you also expect. In fact, it looks like it probably increased a bit. And clearly the pond weed, some reduction of it, but um, at least up to 56 days, not much change in that as well. So pretty much what we expected to see out there with these uh, with the response. Now, I mentioned we didn't go into the Area A uh, combination sites uh, because we had to keep those curtains up a very long time. We figured with half-life that we were dealing with, we'd get those curtains down within 45 days or so. And I, I have to 
preface that by saying we were under the gun to show we had zero non-detect of both herbicides before we could get those curtains up. And for uh, triclopyr, that's one part per billion. And for uh, indithol, it's uh, five parts per billion. So just think about that for a minute. We were treating at 1,000 parts per, uh, per billion with uh, triclopyr and 2,000 for indithol. We actually got down to the receiving water limits, which are much higher. It's 400 parts per uh, billion for triclopyr and 100 parts per billion for endothal. But the hot water board said, we'll give you the permit, but you have to demonstrate that you're down to non-detect before you can pull those curtains up. So the, res the result was what you're seeing in front of you here. You can see all the parts per billion on the left. Um, this is triclopyr. By 14 days, we're getting down there pretty far, but see how long it took to get us out there to our to our uh, non-detect 105 days. And that was the killer because those, those curtains had to stay in there. This created a stagnant condition, so we had turbidity build up. We had a lot of problems that were indirectly related to that as well. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Here's our area A. So again, this is uh, triclopyr in area A. All the sites between sort of showing the whole mixing in the area. But again, it took a long time to get down to that, that non-detect level. And one of the reasons was we had this high turbidity. This is turbidity in area A. And notice it started jumping up after our treatments by the end of June. It's up to five, but we're, we're just going way up there by August. We're up into 15 to 20 and pretty much up into 40 by mid-August. And that problem uh, uh, was exacerbated our problem with the triclopyr because triclopyr is photodegraded. So once you start blocking the light with turbidity, you're slowing down the degradation, and that probably led to our long-term degradation rate of triclopyr running out there 105 days to get down to one part per billion. So, and believe me, the boaters were not happy about this um, because we would hope to get that thing out a lot earlier than that. So what's next? We've got a lot of data analyzing uh, from last year, um, planning year the uh, year two uh, group B treatments that's undergoing right now. Uh, we're assessing all the target plants for spring. We've done one survey in uh, mid-May. We're going to doing another one in early June, and that's probably going to determine where we put the group E methods. Um, keep in mind our criteria is we have to go to areas where we got 75% reduction in biovolume uh, to be eligible. And now we're going to start looking for those areas where we may have our target plants re-emerging. And so we're either going to assign bottom barriers to cover them, diver removal, or spot treatments with UV light. And, and because last year we didn't get into the combination treatments with UV light, that's the first thing the UV system is going to be used for this, this current year, is to go back to those combination tri uh, sites and do the UV treatments down the middle of those, those sites. And of course, we have to continue all the monitoring with the exception of all the herbicides, because you don't have to monitor those this year, we're not using them. But um, it's an extensive uh, monitoring program. It goes on two or three times a week in these sites. And Lahatan is uh, is pretty much insistent on continuing that that sort of uh, frequency of monitoring throughout the second year. The third year what that we do will be another set of non-herbicide methods to try to keep this uh, control down that we achieved in year one. So the decision scheme we're using for Group B methods in year two, which we're now into, is to uh, use this kind of a of a, of a schematic or a decision um, framework. And there's two, three conditions where we won't do much out there at all. If we don't have any target plants that emerge, we won't do anything. If we only have desirable native plants emerge in those sites, we won't do anything. Um, or if we didn't meet the criteria of our 75% reduction, there are some sites where we didn't. But the center two boxes on this chart you see are mostly what we're gonna be seeing now. So we'll have some desirable plants coming up with our target species, the uh, coontail, curly pondweed, and milfoil. And then we'll probably have some areas where there's um, target plants coming up and we don't have any native plants. And depending on the acreage, we're going to determine whether we can uh, use more selective uh, diver removal or less selective bottom barriers and then UV light, which is sort of in between the two. You can do some selection with uh, UV light by where you place it. But that's our approach. And we're right now, this, this week, in fact, and next week, going to be looking at the areas that are likely candidates for these Group B treatments in 2023. And when we have that done, those will probably be starting by the first or second week in June. And, and it sort of close off by saying this year is really unique. You're, all of you are aware of how much snowpack we got. Two years before last year's um, treatment in 2022, 
Um, Lake Tahoe was probably at the lowest it's been in probably 15 to 30 years, that range, something like that. We were down into extremely low water last last year. Already we're, we're like three or four feet above where we were last year at this time. So we're going to see some different conditions in the Tahoe Keys, colder water coming in, more of it. And we're already seeing that we're about three or four degrees behind where we were last year at this time in terms of uh, water temperature elevation in spring. So we may be waiting a little bit longer to get our uh, information on which plants are, are beginning to emerge. But that's the strategy we're using, and it's uh, taken quite a while and a, a lot of money. And I think I'll stop there and, and stop my sharing if I can do that. And if there's questions, I'd be happy to answer those. So, Byron, can you take it? Thank, Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lars. Um, there was one question along the way in the chat from David Kerr and others. Please, uh, if you found that feature, the meeting chat, there's a little icon for it. it should be at the top. And feel free to add your questions and all. Um, David is asking, can you see it, Lars? Or should I read it to you? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, was there yeah, the indication or tendency for increase in effective cyanohabs with effective removal, destruction of the benthic weed communities? Yeah, really good question. We actually had um, at, at the assessments of, of HABs went on from, from May through all the way to, the, to September, and we had some increased uh, HABs in those areas that were herbicide treatments. Uh, we had some elevated uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in there, those areas. But every, the interesting thing, too, is that all the nitrogen and phosphorus levels we found in the Keys were above what is the regulatory standard for Lake Tahoe proper. But we've known that for years. It's a very different system in there. But we did have some exacerbation, I think, of the of nutrients in there. And throughout the summer, we had to go from our different levels of signage to for warning of HABs um, throughout the system. And uh, but we actually had HABs in some control sites. So it, we're getting it. We were getting it in different places. And that's I think another reason is because we had warm water, shallow water in the last two years at the lake, three years or so, certainly in the Keys. That probably uh, exacerbated that. I'm hoping this year with the high water and cold water, we won't see that problem. But they even had HABs out in Lake Tahoe proper last year. It wasn't just in the marinas. Yeah. Yep. Um, Byron, is that a good question? Uh, if there weren't any sort of political barriers and whatnot, what do you think were the most would be the most effective treatment program? <laughs> Procel we well, we would have used Procelicor, <laughs> but mm -hmm. we we uh, as uh, as mentioned before, it's still not approved in California. We were. We actually had it in our permit, to tell you the truth, in the first two versions of our application to Lahotan. And um, it was always one of those, you know, contingencies. If it gets approved, that's really what we want to use. We would take out triclopyr and, and put in uh, prosilicor. Um, didn't happen, so we couldn't do that. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons for, for doing that. The half-life is much shorter. It's effective. It's a good systemic. Uh, and maybe another time we could do that. Um, but I think the, the other thing was the curtains really created a problem because uh, we had calculated that if we didn't have curtains because of the water volume and the, the breakdown we would expect it to find, we weren't going to see anything detectable outside the keys anyway. Um, but the but the real problem came about sort of almost last minute when they said, well, it isn't just it isn't just the receiving water levels you have to meet. You have to have this non-detect threshold. And so that's that became. Um, a real problem. You, if you look at the data, and I don't have time to get a lot of it today, but we reached that receiving water level within a matter of a few weeks, actually. So had we had we been required only to show 400 parts per million triclopyr or 100 parts per, million, per billion endothal, we, we could have met that within a month. And those curtains would have been out. We would have had more mixing. I think it would have eliminated hey, some of the problems. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you cut out again. Um, you were just saying, and the big problem was we've all been waiting for with bated breath. <laughs> yeah, prosilicor. Well, the big problem was the curtains. I mean, we we had to keep those curtains in yeah. way too long, and it just yeah. it created a stagnant condition in there. That was the issue. And uh, this the study's ongoing, but sort of related to Byron's question, um, if uh, if if the current results hold through the end, what do you think the the approach will be? Well, I hate to speculate because um, uh, <laughs> that question is asked every week up there. What are we, oh, what's the right. answer? <laughs> what are we going to do? But I will speculate. I will. So, you know, the real answer is, well, wait till three years and we'll tell you what the answer is going to be after the project's sure. done. Um, 
I could tell you what, what we did last year in some ways was to reset some conditions to probably I don't know, 1965 in some of these areas with endothol. And, and I say that because we know there was native plants there. We know we didn't have a lot of invasive plants when that marina was built uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. But the real question is what's going to be the response coming back? And the fact of the matter is that we didn't treat everything. We couldn't. And so you have adjacent plants that are going to reestablish in some of these areas. And that's why we're looking at these group B methods to, to keep those out. But I think the answer is going to be, I hope, an integrated approach where we look at several methods. And I hope we can include Procelacor down the road because it makes a lot of sense to do that. Maybe you do it every few years, but but it makes a lot of sense uh, to substitute what uh, the trichopyr was just a headache. It's great, but it's a headache. <laughs> yeah, got it. Um, and I see, just a second. I see Alex had a question, I think, or something. Yeah, I'm yeah. have to take him off. Oh, there he goes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, I hear what, you, Alex. Yep. <laughs> good talk, but uh, what is these holes for the open lake? especially the, the future of the, the UV business? That's a really good question. Well, the U, as, you, as you can see, the UV uh, system requires clear light and clear water. Um, and so it's got limitations. I think at Tahoe, it's got some real potential. That water is so clear. Um, the near shore, there's been some, some applications of it. It looks pretty good. On the lakeside marina, it did a pretty good job where it's clear. The Tahoe Keys, I can tell you, I was up there last week and the turbidity is still not great, very good. Um, it's going to be a limitation wherever you use it is, is how turbid is that water? Can you get a good exposure? Um, John can lower that that array down to within a foot or so of the plants easily. Um, and the other problem you have is in the in open lake is you've got these these areas that are fairly patchy. So you got to go after them and you've got some natives out there too uh, in the lake. So my concern with UV is that it's a non-selective method. Another question in the chat from Byron. Do you expect the invasive span plants to continue to spread throughout other areas of the lake or uh, maintain in the Keys? There's yeah, they're, they're doing it now. There's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we will see that. You you, you know, if you understand what but, uh, Curly Pond we can do, um, even though we've, we control some of it there, they still had to harvest last year a little bit, and they're going to have to harvest this year probably. Um, and they've got preventive methods going. They've got double bubble bur curtains out there to prevent fragments from leaving. They have a, a backup station for boats to get stuff off their prop before they leave. There's some very serious, you know, effort being made to keep fragments out of there. A lot of that's being sponsored by the Lead to Save Lake Tahoe, um, one of the partners in this project. But I think it's still, it's going to, you know, it's impossible to stop everything from moving. And, and the thing about curly pondweed is it can establish in these sort of high energy areas around the lake where you'll never see coontail establish. Uh, and milfoil sort of where it's protected. But, but curly pondweed, once it gets started, it can, it can handle a lot of energy, a lot of wave action. It does pretty well. So I think we're going to see some spread. And that's, that's the question is, can we keep up with it and, and keep it in check? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> could you could you say any more about the dynamic between the related to this cyano habs question where if you remove the plants that are taking nutrients out of the water then you provide uh, the you know nutri the nutrients are still there and you'll grow algae instead or something um, what are the what are the um, counterintuitive or counterproductive uh, impacts have you seen yeah, and, and that was one of the reasons we wanted to get in there as early as possible is to have a lower biomass so we'd release less. And the other um, reason for being selected, we were hoping that Aladea would have, be able to sequester some of those nutrients anyway, because we didn't really impact it much. It's it's actually, right now, it's the most prevalent in the endothal sites. It's mostly uh, Aladea out there. Uh, but it is a problem, and I think you just have to uh, treat as early as you can uh, we did have an option of using FOSLOC. The, the thing we got into was by the time we had our data on that was required for the FOSLOC through our permit, um, it, was, it was two or three weeks. And by then, it's already blown out of proportion and that probably wouldn't do much good. So um, it, it is kind of a conundrum. You, you, got to, you want to control the plants. We, we know they do sequester nutrients. So my feeling is you, you really want to maintain as much of the native plant population as you can that are they're really non-problematic. -problem, to keep those nutrients sequestered. Now the Keys property owners have done a great job in terms of landscape and uh, getting the phosphorus out of their fertilizing systems and all that, and, and trying to they're trying to get away from turf and into more non-turf landscape. You know, it's it's a slow process, 
but they're they're working on that watershed uh, directly. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> Other questions, Alex? Do you still have a hand up? I'm not sure if that was a new question or didn't hand didn't go down. Hand didn't go down, but I was what because when I was thinking of the 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 UV is it wouldn't matter if you killed everything because you'd be only doing a small part of the lake every year. Yeah. So no, I, I agree, Alex. It, yeah, and and question of selectivity is probably more important, uh, maybe even in the Keys where we're trying to maintain uh, a higher population. And point Byron was making about the nutrients. In, in the lake proper, there's, uh, you know, we have some native uh, milfoil out there. We have Andean milfoil, which is a really interesting plant. It looks like a tiny conifer. It grows about maybe 20 centimeters tall or so at the most. And it's, but it's out in the, in the you know, near shore, but it's not in the Keys. But the areas where we're seeing curly pondweed, we've got some milfoil, we have uh, Richardson pondweed, we have some natives out there as well. So there's a trade-off, but you're right. I think at some point, uh, the, the benefit uh, of getting rid of the invasive is overwhelms the, the small impact on those localized areas for the natives. Thanks. Any more questions? We still have a couple minutes. Yeah, I was going to tell you if if you want to look at the um, the, the I've said the massive efficacy report that TRPA put together. I should mention too, this is this is kind of an important difference in this project. Um, the development of the plan was sort of I hate to say by committee, but it kind of was because uh, we started off with a plan in 2017. It was it was tweaked for a lot of things, and and these other approaches uh, were were brought into it as combination approaches, which I think is good. But the um, one of the points was that the the monitoring, the critical monitoring for herbicides, for example, and some of the nutrient monitoring was going to be done by a group outside the Tahoe Keys Property Owners Association. The idea was to, to provide as much credibility for that data so you don't have the same people that are that are paying for and doing the application that are also doing the monitoring. So T, TRPA took on that outside role of monitoring and funded a lot of that too. So the folks that were the contractors that were hired to do the, the herbicide monitoring, most of the nutrient monitoring and then water quality monitoring were hired through TRPA, not through the property owners association. So we had a real, you know, a very clear and, and transparent division of, of how that data was gathered and who did it. Good point. Good point. <clears throat> Byron, you're off mute. Did you ever want to say something? Um, yeah, I, I think the uh, conversation about UV um, not needing to be selective kind of sparked my water treatment mind. Um, did anyone ever talk about like advanced oxidation, like peroxide plus UV or permanganate or something just to be a more strong or is that just too harsh for, um, you know, maybe fish or zooplankton that are present? Yeah, we we went through a lot of options uh, and, and thoughts, and I, I think part of the problem was we were trying to, to keep things. I should I, I like to say simple, but they weren't simple. But uh, without too many uh, variables going on to it, I think I think right now, based on what we're seeing here, we, you know, we're the good thing about this group that works on this, and it's it is a collective and collaborative group. Uh, they're very much open minded to new trying new things. And um, and that's, I think, why they really want to push pretty hard to see what UV could do out there. So I think other alternatives or combinations are certainly, are certainly worthwhile looking at. For example, we um, one of our, I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but the um, one of the other uh, treatments was this linear uh, aeration system. It's basically an aeration system that we've got in uh, several sites. And the idea of that one is to try to alter the nutrient availability, maybe reduce the, the likelihood of getting HABs in there. We're not seeing any effect on the macrophytes, which I don't think anyone expected really. And um, the data that shows that we're just not getting anything there. But now, so now they're looking at those sites, uh, maybe including some UV light in those systems to uh, handle some of the nearshore plants that are there, while the aeration system still continues going on. So there's, and this was not in the project, but we just, we're talking about this in the last couple of weeks, and probably will do it this coming year, this year. But yeah, I think there's a lot of options for uh, for new ideas. I think one of the good things about the way this project developed is that we had enough, once we st stood back from it and said, okay, um, if we wanna be able to do something out there using a full range of tools, we have to try everything we can and that makes sense. Now we had a lot of discussions about rotivation, which got thrown out the window for all lots of good reasons. <laughs> 
and, and then of course others said just just dredge just fill in the fill in the keys and and walk away and don't worry about it anymore and uh, that wasn't going to fly either <laughs> so you know and, and most of that came from people that don't live in the keys of course <laughs> But yeah, so I, so I think there's there's still options out there, and I think um, you know if there's other ideas that come up, we keep looking for new things, new approaches. The the key on the approaches is that not only do they have to work, they have to be feasible to use there. It has to that has to be you have to be able to apply them there in a way that's realistically affordable, and they can do it on a scale. And the concern that we have with UV is the scale issue: how large, how many bolts you have to have to make it work. Uh, it's kind of like if you're painting the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, you don't do it with a spray can. Um, you basically scale up to do it. And what's that going to take? And I think by the time we're done with this three years, we'll know what that scale up needs to be, if if it can be done. Yeah. Got it. All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll invite you back at the end. Yeah. The, the grand conclusion. <laughs> yeah, that's be your wrap up. A couple of years, yeah. Or a conference well, I, or something I, like that. I think the next, I think the end of this year is going to be interesting because to me, this is to me the most problematic part. I mean, we had problematic regulatory issues last year. This year, I think it's, it's the efficacy issues of the non, of our, our group B methods. And we'll just have to see how they, how they work out. All right. All right. All right. Great. Let's, uh, let's close that out. And before we say goodbye, let me uh, share a couple of things. Yeah. Sorry um, about the, the technical mess up there. Oh, not no, expect not that. Your fault. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it goes. And thanks so much, Flores, for for sharing all that knowledge and for working on that. Uh, such a it's a beautiful area. A lot of people, including myself, have stayed up there. Oh so yeah, it's lovely. Um, this is the Calms uh, web page for webinars, and you can see this is the one today, and there'll be um, a link up there, and you can see the previous ones. These are all hyperlinks to the the recordings like this, and then we have one next month. I don't see the date set with it. But Randy Turner at SFEI will be talking about um, satellites and cyanobacteria. So it's a bigger scale looking at uh, blooms. And there's a typo in there to examine. Uh, anyway, um, so that look forward to some emails on that once we get the date set for it and post it up there. I'm in. Um, what was that? Hold on one second. Hold on, I'm not sure what that was. Maybe that was spurious. Um, so anyway, let me, uh, I'll, I'll call it. Thanks everybody for joining. We had a good turnout today and uh, wonderful information and uh, look forward to seeing you around next month.